We have the chief Washington correspondent for The New Yorker, Jane Mayer. Her new piece for the magazine examines the impact of Russian interference and a powerful new case that it decided that decided the election. We're going to get to that in just a moment. But first, we want to discuss, Jane, your latest reporting on the new allegation against Supreme Court nominee Brett Kavanaugh. Give us, uh, Jane, if you could, a little context uh, around Ms. Ramirez's accusations. Reading deeper into it, we're hearing that she spent some time working to remember exactly what happened and and there's even some people who were you know helping her remember exactly who it was can you fill in uh, the gaps here and explain her accusations context sure thank you um it is actually my my uh reporting partner on the story co-author ronan farrow who spoke with her but um she did spend uh six days trying to make sure that she remembered this clearly enough to want to come forward and put herself into the middle of this um, just a you know a brawl yeah. basically politically um, she spoke with classmates to try to remember you know talk to them about what they remembered um, and um, she had gaps in her memory partly because it was very upsetting and um, she also um, had been drinking at the time and wasn't sure whether this was the kind of image of herself she wanted to present. But mm -hmm. in the end, she felt it was really important to come forward. And um, she, you know, I think what, you know, stepping back, the, the, so far the story is being defined to some extent by the White House, where there's a real imbalance of power. You've got the White House putting out its talking points, Kavanaugh's people putting out their talking points. You've got this woman who lives in Boulder, Colorado, who told her story to only one place, The New Yorker. And um, it's, a, it's a small kind of megaphone compared to what she's up against here. And it's a scary thing to go up against this. So can you Absolutely. give us a timeline, Jane, of when she decided to, to step forward? Had she been uh, looking at the Kavanaugh hearings, and, and uh, when did she decide to step forward? Or was, well, it, was it Dr. Ford's uh, coming forward that made her decide that she'd step forward as well? No, actually, she didn't step forward. This is the thing. We called her. We heard her name. Mm. This is a story. She did not ask for this. Um, she felt once asked, she had to try to search her memory to really remember and say whether there was something here. Um, but, but this wasn't her idea to come forward. What happened is that 35 years ago, when this incident took place, people talked about it. And people in that Yale class mm. have been talking about it since then. And there is, I mean, everybody here has been talking this morning about how there's no corroboration. There's, there's a very sober background source who was not part of the party, was not drunk, heard about it either that night, he thinks, or the next day. When I asked him myself, does he remember this? And, and, and is he sure that Kavanaugh was the person he heard about in this? He said to me, I am 100% sure. He's told, um, he's mentioned it to other people in grad school over the years. Um, his classmates were talking about it in July before Christine uh, Blasey Ford came forward. We've looked at the emails. They're chattering about it, saying, boy, if the FBI investigates him, there are going to be some stories here that are going to put an end to his nomination. Right. So just, just to be clear, we're, we're not asserting anything other than what the New York Times uh, here. Let me read you a couple of New York Times quotes uh, and, and, and see how it lines up with this uh, New Yorker piece. The Times had interviewed uh, several dozen people over the past week in an attempt to corroborate her story and could find no one with firsthand knowledge. Ms. Ramirez herself contacted former Yale classmates asking if they recalled the incident and told some of them that she could not be certain Mr. Kavanaugh was the one who exposed himself. That was the New York Times. Did she ever express any doubts to either you or uh, Ronan uh, that it was it, it, perhaps it was not Mr. Kavanaugh, Judge Kavanaugh. T to Ronan, she said she was wasn't absolutely certain. She needed to make certain before she was going to say anything publicly. She remembered the specifics, the graphic specifics. It was very upsetting yeah. to her, and she tried to remember for sure 
who that man was who was in her face. Um, and so it took her a while before she felt she was completely certain. Um, though I have to, you know, with all due respect to the New York Times, which is the best paper in America, um, just because they couldn't get the story um, and speak to her or to find the person that we found who remembered it from back then, it doesn't mean it's not true. You know, it's, and it doesn't, I'm, I'm at any rate, you know, I think well, that well, the well, most... Well, let me, let, let, let me stop you there. So mm -hmm. who, who is the New Yorker's corroborating witness? Because the Times says they couldn't find a corroborating witness. So Somebody he, that was in the room at the time that it happened. No, this is, we, as we say in the story, we, we spoke to the people who are alleged to have been in the room, and they kept saying things like, either they didn't return the phone calls or they'd say, I can't remember. Um, you know, and um, this is why I think her call for the FBI is a good idea, because mm -hmm. sometimes something that people might say to a reporter is different from what they might say to an FBI officer <laughs> yeah, exa when exactly. they're in, in, in yeah. danger of, of, a, of yeah. perjury charges. And I, I, well, so I, I think, think it's a good idea. Yeah. Well, you know, it's a hard thing. We tried very hard to put across what we do know, what we don't know, what the crossfire of allegations are. It's all transparent in the story. But, um, at, right. it, it, you know, we, we tried to be completely forthright about it. Right, and, and Jane, that's the thing. The way it's written uh, and, and, and the way things unfold, you can tell there's a woman struggling to remember exactly what happened. There's nobody in the room that wants to go on the record and corroborate it, and yet this is something, according to the story, that was talked about at the time, that was emailed around after Judge Kavanaugh's name uh, came up for the Supreme Court. And uh, Casey Hunt, Jane's exactly right. And again, we don't know what the truth is. That's why we're saying there needs to be an FBI investigation. But uh, people will say one thing to a reporter, they will say quite another to an FBI agent. And of course, the FBI, they are not the super cops. But they do, of course, have the ability to say, tell me the truth, or else you may be going to jail. Well, and as Special Counsel Bob Mueller and the FBI agents working with him are busily uh, demonstrating, if you lie to law enforcement, bad things happen. It is a bad plan. And I think everybody <laughs> realizes uh, that, you know, that's it's more significant. I mean, obviously, I think, you know, when they're speaking with Jane, there's, you know, everybody wants to be honest in their conversations. But I certainly I have a feeling I would be more careful and specific about recollections of any party I may or may not have attended in college. But, Jane, I, I also wanted to ask you about something that's a little bit uh, farther down in your story, but that I'm wondering uh, may not, you know, be something that resurfaces over the course of the next few days. You report that you spoke to somebody about Mark Judge, who Dr. Ford alleges was the other person in the room when the assault, her assault, uh, took place. Uh, and he is describing incidents uh, with perhaps many women in the context of, of the Georgetown days. And I was just hoping you could kind of walk through what your reporting is on that and, and give us a little bit of context about why you thought that was important. Okay. Well, so Mark Judge, as you say, is the other man, he was at the time a teenager, um, who, according to Christine Blasey Ford, was in the room with her when uh, she charges she was assaulted sexually by Brett Kavanaugh. So he's the pivotal witness, really, at this point. Um, and what uh, this, what happened was I actually really received a call from Mark Judge's former girlfriend, college girlfriend, who said, and she's on the record here, her name is uh, Elizabeth Razor, and she was at Catholic University with him, and she said, I, I feel a moral obligation to correct the record here what he's saying about how there's no way that this could have happened because they only knew boys, they only roughhoused with boys, there were no girls basically in their lives. She said, Mark Judge told me that um, he, I, it's a, I don't want to say too, anything too scuzzy on television, but told me that um, he had sex when he was at Georgetown Prep um, with um, some of his friends all with the same drunk woman um, at the same mm. time. And, um, and she's saying this on the record, and she's a, 
a teacher now, um, and she said, I wouldn't betray confidences ordinarily, but I felt it was just too important, and I, I needed to say, there's another picture of Georgetown Prep social life than the one that he painted, and, um, and he knows that. Well, Jane, um, I want to thank you for your reporting and uh, for you and Ronan also, you know, really being able to get these facts um, put together uh, along with Ms. Ramirez's uh, concerns and accusations. But uh, I want to move to your Russia piece because apparently all you do is work. Um, <laughs> <laughs> how, how Russia helped swing the election for Trump. Uh, tell us about your reporting there. This is actually just, it's a piece that's based on a new book called Cyber War by Kathleen um, Hall Jameson, who is a, uh, uh, the head of the Annenberg Center of Public Policy at Penn. And it's a really interesting book. And what she does is she goes sort of where others have sort of feared to tread. She's gone back over the 2016 campaign, looked at all of the data. She's got polls of her own and um, all kinds of analysis and um, concluded that uh, as she said to me, that she doesn't think Trump would be president without the help of the Russian interference in the election. All right, Jane Mayer, thank you very, very much for being on this morning. We really appreciate it. A lot going on. <laughs> thank you. Thanks for checking out MSNBC on YouTube. And make sure you subscribe to stay up to date on the day's biggest stories. And you can click on any of the videos around us to watch more for Morning Joe and MSNBC. Thanks so much for watching.